This is Brandon Jones with Pact Publishing. In this video, we're going to explore categories of design patterns. Specifically, we're going to look at two categories and just a high level look at some examples of design patterns within those categories. So, we'll start by saying what are the categories? Then we'll talk about some examples of structural and creational design patterns. There's a third category called behavioral. We'll talk about that in our next video. So first of all, you might remember this slide, which goes back to our very first section where we talked about the categories of design pattern. Creational is all about creating objects and really taking advantage of that object-oriented concept we know of as polymorphism, which is where a variable type tells us what methods we're allowed to call, and then an object type tells us what will actually happen when we invoke those methods. Structural is talking about the composition of an object. When we think an object, a Java bean, a DTO, a POJO, plain old Java object, a lot of times we tend to think of nouns like a car, a person, a house, building, restaurant, anything like that, a cheeseburger, something that's a noun. But if we think about a noun like a cheeseburger, it's actually made of several nouns, a hamburger patty, a slice of cheese, maybe lettuce, tomato, onion, a couple of buns. So we have to think about how we structure objects so that we can describe each of the subassemblies and possibly even reuse the subassemblies in some other kind of product, like maybe a double cheeseburger or maybe a chicken sandwich where we just substitute out the meat patty for a chicken patty, but everything else remains the same. So that's what we think of as structural. Creational and structural are the two we talk about in this video. Behavioral, which we'll talk about in the next, is one of my favorite. And that's describing the behavior, for lack of a better word, of objects that are doing some kind of work. So how can we design our program in a very efficient way so that one class knows everything it needs to know and we do not take that logic and put it into other classes? Or this is sometimes called spaghetti design, where we have design that is going across several different classes and things aren't really in the right place. One good way to determine if we have spaghetti design is to look at if tests. If we have a program with a lot of cyclomatic complexity, or in other words, if tests nested within for loops, within try catch blocks and mid method returns, that's a pretty good sign that there's a better way we can design this program. Nonetheless, let's start off by talking about creational patterns. So creational patterns, we want to instantiate objects and take advantage of polymorphism, which I described a little bit earlier. And I'm just going to give a quick description of each one just so we can have a bit of a foundation. So first of all, the factory method. I like this one. I use this one quite a bit myself. This is a case where we have an interface and a series of classes that implement that interface. Or we have a superclass and a series of subclasses. The factory method is concerned with creating the appropriate subclass and then returning that. And it typically is going to return that in the variable type, which is the interface that the class implements or the superclass, which the class extends. So this goes back to polymorphism again. Remember, variable type and object type can be different. So in this case, we're making the variable type an interface or a superclass, and we're making the object type a class that implements that interface or a class that subclasses the superclass. So the variable type is always going to be the same. It's a matter of what object we create and stuff into that variable type. There are several ways to implement a factory method. One is to have a series of subclasses that actually override a factory method and return some bespoke or custom implementation. Another way that I like to do it is to have one method and use something called reflection to determine the correct class to actually instantiate and return. Next, we have abstract factory. It is sounds similar to factory method, and indeed it is similar. But in this case, instead of having a superclass subclass relationship or interface and implements relationship, in this case, we really have a more complex object, something like a car. A car would be hard to represent with one class, but a car and all of its subcomponents, like its engine, its doors, its transmission, these are all independent classes that combine together to form the concept of a car. So an abstract factory says, okay, I know what a car is, but a car could be a Corolla, 
It could be a Civic. It could be an Accord. It could be any of these things. And so as an abstract factory, I know that if I'm told to build a Corolla, I know to build the door panels for a Corolla, the windows for a Corolla, and put the engine of a Corolla in this car. So an abstract factory is really looking at creating these complex objects. Object pool, this is one that you may have used as a consumer. This is one that's fairly common. If we have a series of objects that take a long time to create, to instantiate, maybe there's a lot of overhead there, we don't want to create them every time we need them. Instead, it's a good idea to create them and hold them in a pool, and then get an object out of that pool, use it, return it to that pool when we're done, and then, again, make that available for use by another process. When I say you may have used this in the past, think about a thread pool or think about a JDBC connection pool. That's exactly what this is, an idea where I'm going to use this JDBC connection, something that will allow me to connect to a database. When I'm done with it, I return it to the pool. Somebody else can use it. But we only have to instantiate it once. And an advantage of that is, if we're going to have any errors on startup, we'll find that early on when we instantiate the object. Once it's been instantiated, we're not going to need to re-instantiate it, so there's less risk of having error at that point. Builder. Builder is one that I see occasionally in Android. This is a case where we have a construction that can create different objects. Here's an example I have on GitHub from a class I taught a couple of years ago. And in this case, what we're doing is we are accessing the GPS services that are available in a Google API client by using the Google API client's builder pattern. Now, the Google API client will provide us access to several things. It can provide us access to AdSense or AdWords or AdMob. I guess AdMob would be the right approach, which shows advertisements in a mobile app. It could also provide us with access to maps. But in this case, it's providing us with access to location services. So you see, I'm saying add the API location services Oh, by the way, since I have location services, I also want to know when I've connected to location services, and I want to know if that fails. So this builder pattern, we tell it what we want to build, we add some parameters, it builds that, it returns that to us, and then that's something that we can use in our application. So this is where I've really seen the builder pattern quite a bit with those uh, Google libraries. Prototype. Prototype is similar to something I mentioned earlier where I said, I was talking about a cheeseburger as a class. And a cheeseburger, we could call that a class, but we could look at the individual components. We could call those classes as well. The meat patty, the cheese, the lettuce, tomato, onion, and the buns. But I talked about how we could build a chicken sandwich. And a chicken sandwich could be a lot like a cheeseburger. Only we remove the meat patty, we add chicken breast patty, essentially. So in that case, what we're doing is we're starting with a known thing, a cheeseburger. We're cloning that. And we're simply swapping out the attributes that we want to swap out, which in this case is the meat patty. Singleton. Very common design pattern, very easy to do with Spring. In this case, what we're saying is there's only one instance of a class. In other words, only one object that's sitting around. This is nice if you have one resource that you want to share among a series of objects, one kind of central point of configuration or one central point of just knowledge that you want to be universal across a series of normal objects. Another thing about a singleton is we'll often do a lazy initialization, which means there is no object until it's requested. Once it's requested, we create the object and we keep it in memory, and then we reuse it for future requests. So it has some things in common with an object pool, but the difference is an object pool will typically have many objects of which we can pick any one, where a singleton there's only one object. So those are creational patterns. Now we take a look at structural patterns. So a few structural patterns here. An adapter pattern, this is kind of an interesting one. In this case, this is a story of integration, where many times we have an old piece of software, but we needed to match the contract or the interface of a new piece of software. So what we do is we simply create an adapter. An adapter goes from old to new. A lot of work here, especially when you're working with uh, legacy implementations. A lot of times we're doing this kind of adapter work where we're saying, you call it X, I call it horizontal. You know, you call it X-axis, I call it horizontal axis, something like that. And we're just adapting from one vernacular to another.
Bridge is a kind of complicated one. I have not had a lot of use for this one. This is a case where you have a couple of parallel inheritance hierarchies. This one's really hard to describe in, in just a, a kind of short version, so I'm just going to leave that one at that. Composite is an interesting one. This is where you have a tree concept, where you have the idea of maybe branches or limbs, and then eventually you get to a leaf. And the idea is you want to walk over this tree and you want to shake hands with all the branches and you want to do one thing with them. You also want to shake hands with a leaf and you want to do something different with that leaf. But these leaves could become branches if the leaves grow further leaves. Okay. So in other words, we kind of have this composition concept where we can keep walking down this path of branches that are forking off until we get to the end and we get to a leaf. But once a tree grows, that endpoint might become a point of growth and we might grow more branches on it. Decorator. This is a kind of interesting one as well. All of these are interesting. I love design patterns, so I find them all interesting. In this case, we are extending functionality by adding responsibilities. So in other words, we're adding behavior to something after the fact. So I tend to think when you uh, get a degree or something like that, or you get a certificate and you have to renew it every year, that's kind of like the decorator pattern where you're affixing a new seal, like the 2018 renewal seal to your degree. Or maybe you buy a cruise ship pass and it's all inclusive, right? So everything's great. But you show up for the cruise ship and you find out there are some add-ons that you can add to your pass, kind of like an unlimited soft drink pass. So we're going to add that to your room key so now you go to a bar, you show your pass, and we realize that you've bought the unlimited drinks. So that's the essential idea with a decorator. Facade. This one I could see working, again, a lot with legacy systems or integration systems, where you have a whole lot of complexity going behind the covers, but you don't want to make it look that complex. You want to expose a small number of operations to the end user. So you have this facade, which kind of acts like a traffic cop, someone who's directing traffic or someone who's just a central point of contact, like a case manager, a sales representative, or somebody who you escalate problems to. This facade will then delegate out. So if I'm a salesman, I've sold you something, you come back and have an issue with it. As salesman, I want to fix that relationship, and I also want to go out and be able to pull in other resources as necessary. But I might not have you talk directly to these resources. I might have you go through me first. That's essentially a facade. In the flyweight pattern, what we have are a bunch of tiny objects. And these objects have some stateful components and some stateless components. Stateful means we need to keep an ongoing handshake with the end user because we have some data that's only for that end user. Stateless means it's the same for everyone, kind of like when the tax rates change they change for everybody. So what we do in Flyweight is we take the state less stuff and we aggregate that together in one class, and then the state full stuff remains in the other classes. Finally, proxy. This pattern, like this one, because I see it a lot in remote communication. With proxy, what we do is we're sending a message or we're calling a method on what looks like a local class or a local object, and it looks like that object is actually doing all the work. But in reality, that object is just acting as a surrogate or as a proxy for another object that may be on another computer, maybe on the same computer. It just has to do some value-added work, something like that. So essentially, it looks like we're talking directly to the object that's doing the work, but instead we're talking to an object that is simply going to relay our method call to another object, and that other object is actually going to do the work. We will see this design pattern in spring remoting, some really cool stuff we can do with spring remoting.